everyone, and welcome to today's operational information update regarding flooding and landslides in BC. This morning, we'll hear from Minister of Public Safety and Solicitor General Mike Farnworth, Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure Rob Fleming, and as always, we have technical experts from the Ministry of Transportation and Infrastructure and Environment and Climate Change Canada on Zoom. With that, I'll hand it over to Minister Farnworth. Thank you, uh, and hello, everyone. I'm honoured to be here on the traditional territory of the Lekwungen-speaking people of the Songhees and Esquimalt First Nations. Last week, I was able to tour some of the areas of our province that have been hardest hit. Princeton, Merritt, Chilliwack and First Nations communities along Highway 8, such as Cooks Ferry, Nickaman and New Eich. And I met with First Nations to view impacts to their communities along Highway 8, a highway corridor that has largely been swallowed by the Nicola River. I spoke with residents and crews and heard stories. While we're making significant progress in our early recovery, there is still so much work to do to reopen our highways and get people back in their homes. A month ago, I declared a provincial emergency in response to this flooding. Because of the vulnerable state of our highway infrastructure and continued need for public safety measures, I am extending the provincial state of emergency for an additional two weeks until December 28th. I know the highway closures and restrictions are challenging, but they are necessary to maintain a steady flow of goods across the province. Minister Fleming will again today provide an update on the status of our highways. Crews have made incredible progress repairing some routes affected by flooding and slide damage. Some of these repairs are moving steadily, while others are going to take longer to complete. I want to reiterate my thanks to work crews and emergency personnel for their tireless work and dedication to getting these repairs done. This is complex, technical, and in many cases work that has to be done in very tricky terrain. And I know crews are working diligently to complete it. Later today, I will be meeting with the Federal and Provincial Minister's Cabinet Committee on Disaster Response and Climate Resilience, announced a few weeks ago by Premier Horgan and the Prime Minister to outline the progress we're making on flood recovery and the continued collaboration needed moving forward. We'll discuss what additional supports are needed at the local level and how the federal government continue to ensure British Columbians are covered. When we reflect on the past year, we have been through so much. This is our third provincial emergency in 2021, following COVID-19 and a damaging wildfire season. And now, with the current flood situation, which at its peak flooded entire communities and tragically took the lives of four people in landslides. This flooding has displaced thousands of people from their homes and for many, the damage incurred will mean long waits before homes are livable again. We've had weeks of uncertainty, strains on an already stressed supply chain, and now the reality is setting in on the timelines of highway rebuilds. I want to thank everyone for their strength and resilience over both the past month and year. And please know that I will be conveying all of this to our federal partners in the Joint Committee this afternoon. Preparing for and adapting to climate change is a priority for our province. And Premier Horgan has acknowledged the need for more provincial involvement in flood mitigation and dike management. We need the collaboration of all levels of government to make sure we can address the increasing demands and challenging challenges of a changing climate here in BC. Our government stands ready to support everyone who has been impacted by these devastating floods. As of last week, Around $12 million has been, dollars has been dispersed to evacuees through a variety of channels. This includes payments of $2,000 through a partnership between the province and the Canadian Red Cross to provide help to people whose primary residences have been placed on evacuation orders due to the flooding. And I want to say thank you once again to British Columbians for keeping themselves and their neighbours safe and all workers and volunteers who have been engaged in tireless efforts to respond and recover from these storms. While the recovery phase is just getting going and there's still a lot to do to get people back in their homes, we're making progress every day and together we'll get through this. On a positive note, I can confirm today that the fuel restriction order in place since November 19th will be lifted tomorrow, December 14th. 
This measure has been effective in maintaining a steady supply of gas for public use while ensuring our essential service vehicles have priority access to what they need to do to make sure everything's looked after. I want to take this opportunity to thank everyone who abided by and observed the 30 liter rule. When we put this order in place, I said at that time, if we all pull together, we will get through this emergency and ensure that there is enough fuel, not only for our emergency responders and the transportation system to be able to move the goods that we need uh, in this province, but more importantly, that people will have the fuel that they need. At that time, I said, if we do that, we would succeed. And if we were greedy, we'd fail. Well, the people of British Columbia stepped up. Every one of you paid your part. And for that, I want to thank you. On behalf of the emergency responders, the people who've been moving to keep our supply routes open, and most importantly, the people who've been impacted by the floods. By doing your part, by observing that 30 liter rule, we've been ensuring that there's enough fuel for everyone. So for that, I want to say thank you. And with that, I'll now turn it over to Minister Fleming. Thank you so much, uh, Minister Farnworth, and uh, good morning. Um, I want to uh, begin the Ministry of Transportation and Infrastructure briefing today uh, by talking about the thousands of people who have worked relentlessly for a month now, uh, helping first with emergency response, getting people safely off our roads who are confined, um, and now the recovery from the worst storms in the history of our province. On Friday, I was able to see some of those efforts firsthand uh, on the Coquihalla. I was joined by my uh, counterpart, uh, Omar Al Gabra, the Minister of Transport from uh, Canada, and my colleague, uh, Minister of State for Infrastructure, Bowen Ma, uh, for a tour of the highway and to see some of the repairs firsthand. And it was incredible both to see firsthand the damage that was sustained uh, during that weather event and subsequent events, and now the repair work uh, which is happening on the highway. Over 20 impacted sites uh, on the Coquihalla are being actively repaired now. Some were very significantly damaged. Uh, about 130 kilometers of the corridor, uh, with intervals in between, of course, sustained damage uh, to that highway. And the level of destruction from the first storm on November 14th was difficult to comprehend for all of us. And seeing it up close, uh, it was unfathomable uh, what was sustained there. But what was truly impressive to see is the response that is ongoing. Um, I know that within their own global industry, BC road builders are held in extremely high regard and they are second to none anywhere that you will find in the world. Um, that reputation is long established, but I have to say, seeing the uh, repairs that are happening on the Coquihalla, BC's road builders have taken it to an entirely new level and one we can be incredibly proud of. From the utter destruction a few short weeks ago, crews have literally defied the odds. They've, they're going around the clock, regardless of the weather. They're getting the Coquihalla closer and closer to being able to be uh, usable again. Um, two very important milestones were reached. On Friday, on Friday at both ends of the uh, highway, at Bottle Top Bridge on the north end and at Carolyn Bridge on the south end, we established temporary accesses. Uh, those were completed and that has allowed equipment to uh, move over the badly damaged bridges. And this is a development because it's speeding up uh, the movement of construction equipment along the corridor. And in turn, as each site is repaired, all the workers and equipment are being redeployed to the next site, which is making repairs to the entire corridor that much quicker. Um, I have to say that Coquihalla is alive with construction activity every waking hour. We have that to thank um, about 300 people who are now working with 200 pieces of heavy equipment along that corridor. And one thing I heard on, on Friday again and again is that people involved in repairing the Coquihalla take this very personally. It's a point of pride to be part of this important project to connect uh, BC with the interior and indeed the rest of the country. This is from engineers to suppliers to construction firms to workers and their trade unions. All of them understand how important this corridor is to BC, uh, to our economy and to our way of life. The one variable that is at play, of course, and that we can't control is the weather. And there were two feet of snow over the weekend on the Coquihalla, but I have to say the workers, again, did not miss a beat. Um, we have to be mindful that weather events could still hamper work, especially when we start paving. Uh, initially, we were hopeful the Coquihalla would be open 
to traffic, albeit with limitations, uh, because the repairs are temporary in nature, but we initially targeted that to be open by the end of January. Last week, we moved that target up a couple of weeks to early January. <clears throat> and now, thanks to the determination of crews who are going 24-7 at it in terms of the repair work, we expect to be able to open up even earlier than that date. I will have a full uh, Coquihalla update on Wednesday describing the scope of repairs and a timeline for when that highway may be re reopening to commercial traffic. Um, today it's too early to say, uh, but 48 hours from now there I will expect even more work to be accomplished. I was there 72 hours ago and I know that today uh, significant uh, activity has happened uh, over the weekend and um, and so day by day we're getting closer and closer uh, to being able to advise the public on when the Coquihalla might be uh, usable again for commercial trucks and of course part of that strategy is to reopen the number three to general travel but for the time being Highway, th highway 3 remains our only connection between the lower mainland and the interior and our focus there continues to be on safety and performance. It's the lone corridor for semi-trailer trucks moving essential goods. We have about 3,000 trucks a day now on that highway and it's vital that we support the safe movement of essential goods. That's why we've enhanced winter maintenance on the number three uh, along the stretch between Hope and Princeton. We've added more signage. We've provided information to drivers directly uh, to help combat drivers simply going too fast. We've also increased law enforcement, enforcement presence uh, with the RCMP and also with my ministry's commercial vehicle safety and enforcement branch officers. I can confirm that 116 speeding tickets have been issued along Highway 3 so far in December. And let me just say we have zero tolerance for unsafe driving on the Highway 3. I'm sure that many of you saw that recent dash cam footage on the 5A where a commercial truck was dangerously passing on another truck on a double yellow line. Um, that company, I can tell you today, has had its license to operate in BC suspended. While the CVSA is going to continue its investigation and its audit of the company, that evidence has directly led to uh, a suspension. And let me be clear, the vast, vast majority of truck drivers are doing the right thing. They are safe and responsible. They are professionals, and we depend on them to deliver the products we need. And no one is more safety conscious than the BC Trucking Association, who has been an absolutely invaluable partner in helping us to reestablish supply chains that keep British Columbian stores uh, shelves stocked and keep small and medium sized businesses in every community operational. Instead of having layoff notices at Christmas time for interrupted supply chains, those tens of thousands of trucks that have been able to use Highway 3 have kept people employed and working and being able to enjoy the holidays um, with their families. Day by day, our transportation network is getting closer to a sense of, no of normalcy, and after the historic, devastating series of storms, this is an incredible feat. Um, I'm happy to say that traffic in the Lower Mainland is back to a point where we're no longer required to advise people to not drive unless it's necessary. People have been very patient and understanding and adaptable, and for that I offer my sincere thanks and appreciation. And again, to those who have worked so hard to reopen highways and supply chains, who have been outstanding in their service to British Columbia, we offer our thanks. This speaks to the resiliency that we all have in us as British Columbians, and I think it's something that we can all take pride in. And I thank you for the opportunity to provide this update. Thank you very much. A reminder to media on the line, please press star one to enter the queue. You will be limited to one question and one follow-up. First question today goes to Lisa Yuzda, City News. Ooh, it's the question lottery. Minister Fleming, uh, the Coquihalla, you, it, it sounds optimistic that you're thinking that it could be open to commercial traffic. Am I understanding right that you said even sooner than the early January date? And I'm wondering, should people be optimistic about the possibility of being able to travel on Highway 3 for personal reasons over the Christmas holidays, or is that too optimistic? Well, we don't know what part of the holiday season we'll be able to, to do that, but that is the plan. Um, as I said, we'll have a full update on Wednesday. Uh, Every day counts in terms of repairs we're able to make. Um, there are some variables like the weather. Uh, weather can be very uncooperative when it comes to uh, paving some sections of the areas that are under repair right now. So um, it's too soon to say uh, exactly when we um, can expect the, the Coquihalla to be reopened to com commercial traffic and then Highway 3 to be reassigned to general traffic uh, today. But uh, I expect by Wednesday we'll be able to give something 
uh, a lot more precise for British Columbians. Lisa, do you have a follow-up? Yes, more about Christmas travel or holiday travel. Last week, I can't remember if it was Mr. Fleming or, or Farnworth who spoke about speaking to the airlines about increasing flights from the Metro Vancouver area to the interior. I'm wondering what has happened of those conversations and what you are seeing of flights available and what you're hearing from people who are trying to, to plan for, for that trip, not knowing if the roads will be open. Yeah, yeah so the Tourism, Arts, Culture and Sport Ministry is, is taking the lead and doing an incredible job working with the airline industry uh, on uh, expanded uh, regional routes. Uh, I noticed today that uh, WestJet confirmed increased flights to Kelowna from Abbotsford. Uh, we're hearing other carriers expanding their schedule. Both WestJet and Air Canada have also announced price caps on, on those flights and added service that they're offering uh, to people uh, traveling over the holidays. So. Uh, this is all uh, very good news and we appreciate the airline industry deploying aircraft to uh, help people safely travel, uh, friends and family uh, visit uh, different parts of the province over the holiday season. And I expect there will be uh, more uh, carriers that are uh, completing the logistics of, of adding flights right now because I know there's, there's other airlines that are having a good look at, uh, look at that right now. Next question, Parmeet Camera, Red FM. Good morning, Minister. Uh, my question is regarding the uh, Blueberry Council member of Abbotsford. Um, uh, yesterday, BC Blueberry Council member, uh, they met together, uh, they met and uh, they were disappointed with the Agriculture Ministry, especially uh, they, uh, because on last Friday, Provincial Agriculture Minister uh, Lena Popham and the Federal Agriculture Minister Mary Claude Bebo, they visited some poultry farm in Abbotsford, but so far, uh, according to farmers, they didn't get any visit uh, from any of them and uh, to their farms and uh, could you please tell us that when their issues and concerns will be addressed and will any ministry will be paying uh, to be paying any visit to them um, anytime soon uh, i can tell you that uh, that uh, minister popham takes the issue of blueberry growers and agriculture very seriously uh, she has met with and spoken with uh, uh, many blueberry farmers uh, and in fact will be participating in this afternoon's uh, joint uh, federal uh, provincial uh, disaster uh, re recovery uh, uh, table uh, committee meeting uh, and I uh, fully expect her to continue to advocate uh, for the issues uh, that they're concerned about. Parmeet, do you have a follow-up? Uh, yes, actually, uh, yesterday some farmers uh, showed us some pictures in which there was like their blueberry plants, they were like turning black, which is not good for the production. And they were saying that it could take time uh, for soil correction and maybe replanting. So is there any fund which will be set up for them and will there be any help which will be provided especially to them? This is why the Agricultural Minister is looking very closely at the situation when it comes to blueberry growers and the blueberry farms. Uh, one of the key issues, of course, is the state of the plants. Uh, and there may be uh, farms or areas where plants are turning black, which have indicated that, that there may be problems with those plants. Uh, then there are other areas where they're going to have to wait until spring to see uh, whether the plants come back. But I can tell you that uh, uh, Minister Popham is very much aware of the situation, uh, is very much wanting to ensure uh, that uh, we're able to, to, to work to resolve the, the challenges that uh, blueberry growers face, as is in the agricultural sector as general. Uh, and she will be uh, part of the, very much part of the, uh, the recovery table uh, that is uh, underway and that is meeting later this afternoon, the joint uh, uh, f uh, provincial and federal uh, table that is meeting this afternoon, and she will be at that table. Next question, Mira Baines, CBC. Okay. Uh, this question is for Minister Fleming. What's being done to ensure non-commercial drivers are following the rules of the road and uh, driving to conditions? We've heard a lot about commercial drivers. I'm just wondering, um, you know, do you know how many tickets have been handed out for people who are, are using some highways for, or, for uh, non-essential travel? Yeah, so thank you for the question. I know that uh, RCMP uh, stepped up enforcement on Highway 3 is targeting any drivers that are driving recklessly. Uh, excessively speeding. Um, they're also checking to make sure that travel is truly essential for those that are in passenger vehicles. We don't want uh, a large number of passenger vehicles, any unnecessary pass passenger vehicles on that corridor mixing in with commercial truck traffic. It's just, it's just too dangerous. 
um, and uh, and that's why we're going to provide an update on on Highway Five so that we can, uh, you know, sort of give a general idea about when that sort of travel is is allowed again. But um, I expect that uh, commercial drivers as well as um, drivers um, under the essential orders have have been part of the ticketing regime. I also know that the uh, biggest advocates for enhanced RCMP enforcement on corridor three was the truck driving industry itself. Um, they're standing up for the vast, vast majority of their members who are taking uh, the conditions of the numbers three seriously, uh, taking safety as the number one concern on that corridor. And they appreciate the fact that the RCMP is cracking down on those who are uh, disobeying. Um, the signage and the reminders and the notifications about driving to condition. Mira, do you have a follow-up? Yes, I think Lisa got to this uh, as well. Um, we're also, this is also for Minister Fleming. Um, we're wondering, is there any consideration to temporarily allow uh, non-essential travel on highways uh, with restrictions uh, on certain dates around the holidays? And many families are feeling completely cut off from their loved ones. I completely understand that. It's very difficult to reestablish supply chains, disrupt them, reestablish them. Um, so that's um, why our focus really is on getting the number five uh, and the number three, having two routes to the interior, um, having two uh, national uh, uh, train carriers has been really, really important to getting at the backlog of, of goods that were in our ports. Um, for those goods that are transported uh, along truck, having the number three has been vitally important. Having the number five and the number three is going to be a real advantage that so will allow us to safely consider uh, having um, general travel uh, separate from uh, commercial trucks, semi-trailers uh, on the number five. So we'll, uh, we'll be able to give a more precise uh, level of detail on what the holidays might look like, uh, which with new dates uh, perhaps um, on Wednesday uh, and that's all based as I said earlier on the progress that road builders and contractors and designers engineers have been able to make on repairing the number five next question question excuse me Richard Zussman Global News uh, this is for uh, Minister Farnworth is there a sense with the rationing ending uh, tomorrow are we back uh, to full capacity uh, in terms of our gas supply, are, are we done uh, importing gas in from the United States and Alberta and can sustain ourselves with Trans Mountain? And are there any worries about, um, you know, a, a change in people's behavior and what impact that could have on the, on the supplies? We're confident uh, in the, uh, the supplies with uh, the Trans Mountain pipeline uh, up and running. Um, and the uh, additional supplies that were coming in and, and still come in uh, by, uh, by rail uh, and, uh, and by barge. And so we're confident uh, in, the, uh, in the supply chain when it comes to fuel. Um, and I fully expect that, uh, you know, people I think really understood the importance of observing that 30 liter rule. And, you know, we asked people to pull together and they did. And we could have uh, failed or we could have succeeded and we succeeded because people did the right thing. And that I know that uh, people, I think, have an awareness of the importance of our supply chains, and I fully expect uh, them to, you know, to continue to, to be responsible, uh, but uh, we're confident in the, uh, the, the fuel supply chain. Richard, do you have a follow-up? Yeah, unrelated to the storm, but uh, for Minister Farnworth on the other part of your portfolio, uh, is it appropriate uh, that Surrey Mayor Doug McCallum continues on as chair of the police board, continue uh, considering he's been charged? Uh, and do you believe that the mayor should step down uh, while uh, these charges are working their way through the system, uh, not just from the police board, but from his job as mayor as well? Um, that's uh, an issue for the, uh, the mayor uh, to reflect on. Uh, there's no requirement under legislation. Uh, the matter is before the courts, and that's really the only comment uh, that I'll be making on that at this time. Next question, Nelson Bennett, BIV. <clears throat> Hi, yeah, thanks for taking my question. Uh, last week there was some discussion about um, how once the immediate repairs are done to highways like the Coquihalla, that, they, that you may be looking at some more longer term hardening of infrastructure, you know, building in some additional climate resilience. I'm just wondering though about railways because um, it looks like 
some of the railways uh, that were damaged were repaired quicker than the highways. But I'm I'm just wondering if there's any, and I realize that they are private, you know, uh, companies. But is there any discussion uh, likely to take place between the BC government, federal government, and the railways about addressing? future concerns about rail infrastructure, considering how important it is to supply chain, you know, and building and resilience. I can tell you the, uh, the railways did a remarkable job uh, in working to, uh, to deal with the challenges that they faced, both CN and CP, uh, and they were in constant uh, contact uh, with us. Uh, they are uh, federally regulated uh, industries that with their own separate federal legislation. Uh, but I can tell you in my discussions that I've had with them, they are acutely aware of the, uh, the issues and the challenges they face in the, in the canyon. And I think one of the critical things is, as always, is to be able to build back in a way uh, that, uh, that can withstand uh, you know, uh, climate-related re- climate events and other events uh, that, uh, that they may face. Nelson, do you have a follow-up? Uh, okay, maybe also just wondering, is there, has there been any discussion about using railways in, in sort of emergency situations to move people, you know, putting bud cars on and that sort of thing? Um, we, uh, we work with the railways on a wide range of issues uh, at this point, um, not in, in the context of, of, of having to move, uh, move people. Uh, but the reality is, is that the railways have been uh, very cooperative in wanting to make sure that supply chains are in place. And the message we got them, from, we received from them, is is how can we help? So um, I'm I'm confident in that relationship and the fact that uh, uh, they were a very good partner uh, during this uh, and continue to be uh, during this uh, particular state of emergency that we've been facing. Next question, Cindy White, Castanet. Hi, I would like to talk about. Highway 3 this weekend. It was closure after closure after closure. When you open that highway to non-essential travel, I mean, what is being put in place to ensure safety and that there won't be repeated crashes with just regular vehicle traffic on there? So what we're thinking right now is, um, and what would happen naturally anyway is when we get the Coquihalla open, the vast majority of truckers are going to prefer uh, driving that route. And so that will take a significant or almost all the truck traffic off of the number three, which will make it safer for uh, general travel, which currently is not permitted. Um, so uh, we, we're, we're consulting with the industry. We're working with mayors up and down the corridor. Uh, we're talking to a lot of people about um, our plans and what essential travel orders might look like, because they will look different. We'll need one for the number five when we reopen it, for example. And we'll have to clarify uh, the existing order on the number three. So we'll have more to say about that in the days ahead. But uh, suffice to say that the, the, the thinking around safety that you've indicated is is precisely what is going on with our ministry and uh and and the industry right now cindy do you have a follow-up yeah and i just wanted to get back to that you talked about trucking in the industry i'm talking about regular vehicle traffic if you open sometime during the holiday season i can just see a whole rush of people heading up that highway and i'm concerned about uh, the safety of people over the holiday season who've never driven that route so we'll keep on things like the enhanced maintenance. We'll keep on the portable sign reader boards and the driver education and being aware of the new posted uh, speed limits on the number three uh, when we uh, make adjustments uh, to it for general travel. Um, I suspect you're right. There will be a, a volume of holiday traffic there, but I also suspect that uh, given uh, what's happening with the health crisis and um, COVID-19 that uh, people are taking provincial health advice, which is to stay home and stay local uh, this, uh, this winter period. Uh, indoor uh, winter gatherings uh, are problematic right now, and uh, I'll let Minister Dix and Dr. Henry speak to that. But um, yeah, uh, we will uh, keep on the existing uh, enforcement and safety uh, enhancements that we've been doing on that corridor. Thank you very much. That concludes today's update.